Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to The Accelerator with Michael Conniff. That's me. I am joined today by Katie Dunn and Kat Weaver, who are uh, here from Power to Pitch. Welcome to the podcast, both of you. Great to have you. Thanks for having us, Michael. I want to remind everybody The Accelerator is uh, available on all the major podcast platforms that I've ever heard of, uh, including Apple, Amazon, Audible, um, also on Spotify and YouTube among about six others. And on Spotify and YouTube, we have both audio and video. So um, um, that's uh, that kind of explains that. We are dedicated to founders, entrepreneurs, startups, and the angels and venture capitalists, family offices, investment firms who, who try to help them get going and get started. And uh, actually, um, Katie and Kat are from Power to Pitch, and they kind of straddle that... Um, that line because they they do uh, a lot of pitching and helping people with their pitching, I should say, and then also help them raise money. So kind of an interesting uh, mix for us. I also want to finally mention, I just started another podcast called The Angel. So this is The Accelerator. That's The Angel. People will be hard pressed to tell the difference production wise, but uh, it's uh, The Angel is, of course, aimed more at the money side of things. So you actually, I thought hard, I said, should they be The Angel, The Accelerator? But the accelerator is kind of more well established, so I thought that would be the best bet. So, with that long introduction, um, I actually wanted to start with Cat and and the pitching, um, and here's why: because I, uh, Katie told me that Cat um, had was uh, uh, had 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 done a lot of pitch contests and had, I think, was it won twenty three out of twenty four? Twenty two of twenty three, so close 20. enough. 22 out of 23. She, you won 22 of 23. So because I don't want this to be just another boring podcast, I'm going to ask you, why did you lose that one? You'd be surprised how many times I get that question. And I actually, <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I made a post about it because that competition that I lost has actually been featured on Disney Plus now, oh. uh, called Own the Room. And the girl I lost to, I mean, she has her PhD. She's literally saving the world. So I, she, she totally deserved it and no oh. regrets there, but it was, I got a great opportunity out of it nonetheless. Oh, good. So not, so you're a gracious loser and a gracious winner. And she came in second, by the way. So second, it right. wasn't like she right. didn't play still. She just came in did second. You hear the, Katie, did you hear the pitch at any point? Did you, did you hear the pitch for this company? For her first company, I have heard it. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. And all right. So I'm going to ask you your reaction. But first, Kat, what did um, what company were you pitching, and what was the pitch? Sort of in a nutshell. Sure. So long story short is well, I'm a two time accidental founder through and through. So this first company that I had won all those pitches for, I started in college after I had my valuables stolen out of my gym locker. I didn't want to be the fanny pack girl, and I just needed my ID, cash, key, and essentials with me. So I invented a wearable wrist wallet amongst other wearable accessories for traveling, working out, bar hopping, tailgating the work so you don't have to worry about things. And I actually, in the early days, I lost everything to a fire. So I was making everything at my mom's bridal store. And so doing pitches was my form of survival. It literally was the only way I could get through. I didn't have a natural network or angels or, or anything. So I had to figure out really quickly how to be clear and concise and, and get my point across. So I was referred to by a professor to do one. And my parents used to joke that I should pitch for a living instead of actually running that company. So I took them <laughs> seriously uh, six years later. And and, um, and what was the second company? Did I miss something? The first one was the wearable wrist uh, wallet, I guess. But what was the second? Second is power to pitch. So oh, it also okay. it came by accident because FedEx posted my top pitch tips on their YouTube channel and I had hundreds of founders DM me, how do I tell my story and raise money and do all these things? So I started coaching on the side, up just based out of a need and it just exploded. So I sold Locker Lifestyle after six years and decided that I needed to take power to pitch full time with the mission of helping founders get funded faster. Okay, so Katie... Um, and I have to point out, Katie and I live in the same town, uh, which we will be an undisclosed location today. I usually tell everybody where I live, but I think it's better to not tell anybody in this one. But we live like a few miles away from each other. But I have not met just virtually. But but uh, every time I suggest it, she comes up with some lame excuse. <laughs> That's 
church <laughs> not to meet me. That's okay, Katie. I'm not going to take it personally. But um, so you heard the pitch too. So you heard the power to pitch pitch from Cat. Katie, what did what did you think when you heard the pitch? I guess you thought it was pretty good. Yeah. So Kat and I actually got introduced by one of uh, my founders. So I'm an angel investor and I've invested in about 17 companies. And so uh, early last year, my one of my founders came to me and said, I've hired this woman to help me with uh, with a specific pitch that for something we're working on. And I feel like you guys just have to meet. And so you know, you, I'm going to introduce you. And I said, okay, great. You know, well, let's make it happen. So Kat and I zoomed and she told me about power to pitch and I just loved the concept. And I have worked with so many founders, uh, both formally and informally and thought, you know, I, I've, I know that I can send her clients. Uh, and so I made a couple introductions. Um, one of the founders I advised for signed up immediately and has been extremely successful, having won 30,000 in grants last year alone uh, from going through the program. And so, yeah, Kat and I just started talking. I was still working in corporate America at the time. And we talked for an hour that first time and looked at each other and said, do you want to talk again next week and next week and next week? And when I left corporate America, we looked at each other and said, like, we should do this together. And, you know, I can bring the investor perspective and the finance and due diligence background and expertise. And Kat obviously has the storytelling expertise. So it's two for the price of one, basically. Well, what I love about it, I think, as I think, you know, I'm uh, storytelling is, is my sweet spot. Um, and that's kind of what I do, but you know, I'm, I don't do pitches. I, I think pitches are really hard. Um, I can, I, I'm very happy to critique a pitch and I feel like I'm pretty good at critiquing it, but I, um, I'm not, I, I have a hard time doing it myself. And by the way, not just in startups, but, um, in, uh, Hollywood, you know, where pitching is even more important than startups. Um, I, th I think, I mean, people, people who are really good at it usually do really well. So, so I am going to ask you, Kat, what, what is the secret sauce of pitching and how do you convey it in power to pitch? How do you get that across? Well, we might be here all night if I fully answered that, but the whole have, gist is... I have, I have time. <laughs> the whole gist is, and what Katie and I preach all the time is that, and we share the same brain on these things, which has been so incredible, but you know, we, we tell founders that your audience is buying into you before what you do. And a lot of founders, they try to be too technical and overshare. And at the end of the day, you know, they're talking to a human who is potentially investing in them and they're choosing you as a human. If you have to pivot or hard things come up, mm -hmm. like they have to trust that you as an individual are going to be coachable and transparent and gritty through the process. So that is number one, like the number one rule essentially that we're going through with, with all of our founders um, in terms of a secret sauce per se. Yeah. So that's, you know, I've heard that more than once in regards to sales. Um, and I guess a pitch is, is basically a sales call, right? Um, at least in some respects, that if that they're buying you, they're not buying the product, they're not buying the service. So, um, but let, let me talk a little bit um, um, with Katie about the components of that, because you you have these this other angel perspective. So you've heard a zillion pitches, I'm sure. So what what are you looking for? What are you listening for? I mean, I, like Kat said, it is much, very much about the founder. I'm, I'm looking for, like, in that initial introduction, uh, if somebody's has is reaching out to me cold, I want it to be super brief. I want them to tell me, you know, give me three bullets about themselves and the business, and that's it. And so that I need something to pique my interest. Um, I want them to be very clear and concise. Don't use a lot of jargon. Don't give me a lot of acronyms i don't know be very simple and specific that is so critical and then when i meet with the founder you know i'm looking for transparency honesty humility vulnerability i'm going to ask questions like what's the thing you're struggling most with right now and you know where where why do you think i can be helpful where do you need help uh that kind of stuff and i want them to I don't want somebody to come across as I can do it all. I just want your money and that's it. That's, that's not the point. Like there, mm -hmm. I want the founder to realize I'm a resource. I can provide help with strategy and net, a network that can move this business forward in, in, in addition to my cash. 
what would you add to that cat in terms of like the personal relationship or the business let's stick with the pitch so so um i have on my on my um on my whiteboard here um something bill gross said i think it might have been a ted talk in some kind of speech and he he started idea lab and has probably done as many startups as anybody um but he said first is timing which is interesting first is timing not founder second is team not founder not just founder uh third is idea fourth is business model fifth is is funding is sort of that part of it but i guess what i'm what i'm asking is is okay you want to be concise you want to be clear you want to have uh, you want to be an ethical founder. You don't want to be dealing with people whose ethics stink. You want somebody who's going to be around when things go bad and not quit, right? But um, but all right. Well, let me let me be more specific. How often do you find yourself editing the story uh, of the pitch, Cat? How how often do you edit the story and edit and even to the point of like kind of pivoting the company in the pitch? Like you say, you know, that's not really what you're doing. You're really doing this. You have to stress this. Does that um, happen? Not as much as that, but we are 100% uh, of the time altering the story because typically people are either oversharing or they're not even including much of themselves and why they're qualified to solve or go through with taking after this problem and, and solution. So I think it's kind of a combination um in that sense but in terms of the business model or pivot no we just help actually clarify it as kind of a giving them a bird's eye view because they're so close in the business so they typically say things as if someone were to know or understand what they're building and be on the inside so we don't want them to pitch their audience as if they are a target consumer that is a very very big differentiator so you can still educate an investor an audience member and bring them into your world but you can't assume that they're going to walk in the store and buy your product off the shelf or, or use it or wear it or whatever that the case may be. So we have to take more of an outward and educational perspective to the pitch itself. How does that affect the pitch? I'm, I'm curious about that. So, so if somebody comes in and they're not going to be the wearer of your, your, your wallet on your wrist, right? He's somebody with a three piece suit. It is not going to put that on. How do you convince somebody like that, that personally is not, necessarily going to be or, or maybe it's a, a a woman and the product is for for men right or men and the product is for women so how do you how do you uh navigate that so we like to start with the explanation is is uh, almost like shape shifting so you have to put yourself in the investor shoes and the investor you have to educate them enough to put themselves in the consumer shoes so it's a matter of taking a high level approach in this way there's there's Q and A, there should be a conversation. You don't need to pull up a deck in order to explain or have a full demo just yet, but it's a high level verbalization as if you were to start mm -hmm. to use the product and figure out, okay, what are the main pain points? Why will this work? Why will you win? Those are the elements that are enough in an initial pitch to get someone to start to at least bring someone in the, you know, your world in the way. Okay, I'm, I'm, getting, a, I'm getting a better picture. And, and um, Katie, your business model at power to pitch. I, I, I believe you told me that, and actually this is what I like best about what you two do, believe it or not. Um, aside from the fact that I'm, that you're uh, a pitching savant cat, I think that's, 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 that's great. And you're an investor, Katie, but I, I like your business model. Basically it's a fixed fee model. Is that fair that somebody who pitches, you kind of are with them helping raise money um, and, uh, that's kind of an open-ended commitment on your part, isn't it? And, and what do you charge them, Katie? What is, what does that cost? Well, well, we're not going to disclose that because we're, we're, uh, you know, that's, well, we want people to talk to us first, but, uh, cause we don't, we don't accept just anybody. We want to make sure that a company has product market fit, uh, an MVP, some sort of traction out there. So it's, it, you know, we're not for everybody, but that is right that we are a fixed fee. We don't take a percent of the raise. 
We're not like an accelerator where we kick somebody out after a certain amount of time and then offer no post-program support. We are with the founder from their life for their lifetime of their pre-seed to seed stage raise. And they can come back to us. Like we actually have been working with some founders that are exceptional. They're fantastic. They just got their product. Their product was just launching in Target when we started working with them. And while we were working with them, they got launched in Costco. And they came to us yet literally yesterday and said, we're, we're pretty much done with the program, but we just have gone through all our numbers and we don't actually need to fundraise this year. We need to, we're probably going to need to fundraise next year. And we're, we said, that's great. No problem at all. Start talking to us in a couple months, you know, a couple months before you want to start raising at least six months before you want the first check to hit and we'll refine what we've already put together to update your story, your metrics, your financial plans, all of that. And, you know, that we also, we have a very large community where we actually engage with the founders uh, once a week on a Zoom call so that everybody can kind of meet, talk. It becomes a little bit like invest, like founder therapy, but uh, yeah, it's great. So we, we offer, you know, we're always adding new things to the program, new resources, uh, we've got a great network of, of people that we work with outside of just the pitching and we're, our network becomes the founder's network. So that means fractional CFOs, um, sales experts, you know, whatever connections we can make, we make. That's great. That's great. Um, now, fortunately, because I have two of you on the podcast, I can ask Kat how much you charge. Just, just, <laughs> just kidding, Pat. Cash. Um, but here, here's the th reason I brought it up was not to uh, embarrass you or give away trade secrets. But um, let me just say this. It's it's because it's a very reasonable deal for a for a founder. It's it's a very reasonable deal. And um, you get kind of a lifetime commitment for that. And um, I've been um, I'm going to bring you some customers. I promise. I promise I will, because I think it's such a good deal. And uh, you're so you're you're specialized, but you're specialized in you know not just the pitching, but also the fundraising. So I think that's a very unique combination um, and and very interesting. So let me let me let me. Well, you had one of our our companies on your podcast, Michael Tampon Tribe, was oh, where Jennifer fantastic. Eden was a guest on your podcast a month or two ago, I think. So yeah, yeah she's fantastic. She was and she's definitely an example of somebody we changed her story, and it's been extremely effective for her and her fundraising efforts. Yeah. Just for people uh, who might have missed that podcast, um, it's a uh, um, uh, tampon products made completely organically. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's becoming uh, or focused, I think, B2B now, right? B2B with- There is a lot of B2B. Yeah, there's B2B, B2B. and B2C. And there's apparently nobody else doing this or very little competition for that niche. And she- Yeah, well, the whole thing is that some can say they have, they're organic, but they're the only 100% certified organic, which a lot of people don't realize these chemicals and products and things. Yeah. So we- for, so she's pitching a lot of men who will never use tampons or some of her products or right, where so yeah. she had to take the perspective of being okay and uncomfortable with some of this language and those changes in order to talk to men, women, whoever it might be in order to get them to understand that level of impact. So uh, here, here's the difference between what I do and what you do. So I am, um, and there are, there's some similarities, but there are big different, you know, real differences. Every time I'm, uh, ever since I met Jennifer Eden of Tampon Tribe, I've been trying to get her to change the name of the company. Um, and um, there's, there's sort of, and, and part of it, uh, maybe it's because I'm a guy, maybe it's because, you know, hearing the word tampon makes, makes me uncomfortable or makes men uncomfortable. But, um, but it's also because I think if they became the tribe, that they could open the door to other um, organic products sold B two B in a similar fashion. Anyway, that's a that's a you know that's for her to decide, of course. But but I think that that um, in fact I in within the last week I met a company I'm going to introduce to her that is sort of doing the same thing with a different kind of product, but they're still driven by sustainability, and um, um, and they are going B two B. So they should meet anyway, because she's like in that space. But, but uh, yeah, so I'm, um, I, f I tend to focus a lot on the words and the names of the products and the names of the companies. And, um, 
and so on. But but this is not about me. This is about you. So, um, Katie, uh, you've mentioned that you were in the corporate world. What, what, um, where, where were you and how did you get to that place before you met Kat? So I was in commercial real estate finance. I worked for various banks and financial institutions that are many of which are household names. Uh, but what I was doing that and what made it so relevant to what I'm doing now is when you're underwriting a commercial real estate deal, you're looking at the tenancy of the buildings to make sure they can pay the rent so that the borrower or owner of the building can pay the mortgage. That's where I come in. So I was diligencing companies all the time and people and businesses and all of that. So, uh, and I just, I love that part of it. I love learning something new. Um, and then I got to start, I started angel investing. Uh, I was always investing in, you know, I invested in stocks. I produced a movie. I did a bunch of different things, but I really loved startups. And one of the first ones I did was an Irish spirits company. And uh, I did that deal because I, the founder uh, is the brother-in-law of one of my very good friends. And that's how I found out about the deal. And I just got hooked. I was like, this is so fun. And it's, it's so everything's so positive and exciting. Um, and the, you're the, I liked the freedom that somebody had to say, Hey, I've got an idea. Let's execute on this. Whereas the corporate world, I mean, I couldn't even really post on LinkedIn. I, I really wasn't allowed to post on LinkedIn. I, you know, my views were not my own. Um, yeah. and it was very limiting and there was a committee for everything. And so the, this, the entrepreneurial world has been so exciting and fun to just be um, explore all these opportunities. And Kat is an incredible partner and we share the brand, same brain, like she said, on so many things. And it's been so fun to, to bounce ideas off of her and, uh, and for her to do the same and support each other and like how we want to grow power to pitch and help as many founders as possible. And Kat, you're the accidental entrepreneur. So when when you were when you took a job that wasn't an accident, what 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 was your what was your journey like to get to this point? Well, I I mean, in your first startup, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even know what an entrepreneur actually was. And so, but I'm grateful for all of those struggles because if I didn't have them, I would have never gotten here and I would never get to share the same perspectives with founders because I know how hard it is. I know how many times you want to quit before that small break happens. And like I even, uh, so before I did my first segment on Good Morning America, Good Morning America didn't know that I was still, my inventory was in my parents' basement. I was working out of their basement and I said yes. And I had to sh be able to ship 10,000 units within 48 hours. And I went upstairs to my mom, so upset and crying. And I'm like, I can't do this. The biggest opportunity. And she looks at me and she goes, that's the easy part. You get your ass back downstairs. You tell them you're going to do it and we're going to figure it out. And I just looked at her and I nodded and I moved into a, a warehouse weeks later and did four segments with them. So it was constant uncomfortability and, you know, taking risks. And I didn't imagine meeting a partner like Katie was also an accident in a way of like mm -hmm. a great accident. And, you know, you find these people in support systems and opportunities and each one I'm super grateful for, despite how hard it is. And I know there's so many founders out there who try to hide the difficulty. They aren't as transparent about it. So I'm trying to share more of it's okay. It's happened. It happens. It will happen. Um, and, you know, there's, there's always a way around or, or through in that sense. So, yeah. you know, I know it's a long-winded answer, but we, we see just a lot of struggles and it's it's not unusual to have to go through things like that. So so we've got a couple minutes left. Let's let's talk about some of the companies you've helped. Uh, maybe you can name them and 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 uh, and take a victory lap or or tell us a little bit about them. So give us a couple of examples of um, companies and why you um, um Katie said you don't accept everybody. So, you know, why you accepted the company and why why you think they're a winner? Uh, Katie, you want to go back and forth? I'll do one, you do one. Sure. So one of the first ones that comes to mind is a founder we're working with. She was in a payment plan with us, and or they, excuse me. So they're, they're twins and they'd never pitched before. Joined the program and knew they needed to get in on their messaging. They really needed money for inventory. We helped them in a weekend and we helped them win an $85,000 grant through Target and Revolt. So they're called the Guilty Grape. 
they were a prime example of being coachable, not having too much in the bank, but just being needing that little extra push and refinement. And, and you know, now we're helping them fundraise. They got to push back the fundraise because of the immediate cash flow from the grant. And they learned all those skills through the initial pitch. So that's what, you know, what is the uh, what is the guilty grape? So they are a uh, wine for the black consumer. They have uh, a QR code on each label that educates you on the type of wine, where it comes from, how to pair it. So they wanted to bring a more educational perspective to their community because no one was really serving them or educating them. And they became sommeliers and really honed in on you know their energy and not just wanting wines that were sweet and people making assumptions about them. And they've done a really, really excellent job of educating not only their community, but um, those around them. And in fact, there, you know, there are some awful stereotypes about, um, you know, wine and, and black people that need to be, you know, blown up. And, and so that sounds really interesting. How about you, Katie? What's your, what's your, what's your choice? Uh, well, I love cheeky cocktails. So the founder, April, uh, had, has been in the drinks industry for, 20 years. And she was an educator, worked for different Diageo and other uh, Bacardi drinks makers. And she developed her first product, I think about seven or eight years ago, which she then iterated during COVID to Cheeky Cocktails. So Cheeky does is they make juices and syrups that are shelf stable for two years that go in the majority of the 50 most popular popular cocktails in the world. So it's a hundred percent like lime juice, lemon juice. Um, she makes honey agave syrup, simple syrup, espresso. Kat's favorite is the espresso syrup to make quick espresso martinis. Uh, but she, the reason why she has been so successful, um, she's extremely coachable. She is willing to learn super hard worker, an incredible networker, and she started in our program. So I've known her for years under her first iteration of her company. And she was pitching and pitching and pitching and not really getting anywhere with the, the second iteration and signed up with us uh, in November. Kind of, we were giving her investor intros starting in like mid January because we didn't want to do it over the holidays, of course. And she raised $50,000 from angels in the first couple of weeks of her pitching. And the, you know, the thing that she says is that the biggest difference is now she sees when she's get, telling her story and giving her stats and giving her pitch, she sees the lights go on with the audit, with the person she's talking to. She, uh, it's a, she said it's a massive difference night and day to how she was talking with, to people before and the, their eyes would just gloss over and she could tell that she lost them. But now they get engaged right away. They see the benefit. They see the value. And she's having incredible success. She's gotten to the Bellagio in Las Vegas and has, you know, over 400. She's in over 400 doors across the country in Canada. And it, it, she's going to be a star. That's exciting. And, and Kat, what do you remember about that pitch? And what did you do to help it? So a big thing with her story is she didn't include enough of her background and why she was qualified to solve this problem. She had amazing industry experience and she yeah. just kind of blew by it. And so we wanted to qualify her with the audience and really educate them. So that was a major piece. And another one is, is really the, the impetus of the business. Like she, you know, we, we gave a moment in time and then brought out the problem on a bigger scale tied in with her own personal problems. So those were two major pieces to really refining her story. But like Katie said, she came in willing to take on the challenge. She was coachable with the challenges and gaps and holes we were poking and, and her pitch and storyline. So that made her the perfect candidate and she was gritty. When an issue came up, she was transparent about it, asked the right questions and mm -hmm. was okay to admit that she wasn't good at everything or, or great. And she surrounded herself with the right people. Surprising but true that people are very reluctant to talk about themselves, even though they've started a company for a personal reason. It's it's kind of a it's it's a bit of a baffling to me, but but it's easily overcome if if you if you give them the right advice, which of course you 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 both do. I want to remind everyone you're listening to the Accelerator with Michael Conniff. Uh, you can go to my website michaelconniff.com. I don't expect you to know how to spell that. It's c o n n i f f dot com. Michael Conniff. Um, 
Also, we're on uh, all the major platforms, as we said before, both uh, podcasting, YouTube, and uh, Spotify. And want to remind you again to uh, to to rank us, to rate us, and to subscribe to us. We're about to do a massive uh, email uh, uh, campaign, so we're hoping that uh, that will spread the word even even uh, farther. And uh, I want to today thank Katie Dunn and uh, Kat Weaver. Um, who have a great, great little company that seems about uh, on a per capita basis, I would say it's about as most as as helpful or more helpful than any company I've come across uh, since I got in the startup space. So uh, congrats to you both. You seem to have great chemistry and um, uh, I wish you all the luck in the world. Thanks so much, Michael. All right. Thanks for being with us. And uh, Remember to come back and uh, to the next Angel or Accelerator, because as I like to say, we'll be back before you know it.